Marva Collins believed without education, man is a slave, a savage, wandering from here to there, believing whatever he is told. Most people know that our African American ancestors were enslaved, mind, body, and soul. They were stripped of control over anything, including their own intellect. All these years later, we know that we have the power to become more because so many of our predecessors fought for the educational rights of future generations. Hello, my name is Renee Watkins Clark. I am a member of the English Language Arts Department at Charles F. Rush High School. I want to begin by thanking you for taking the time to celebrate the contributions of African Americans to the history of the United States. We can all agree that this has been a year for the history books. In the past, we celebrated African American, African Americans' contributions to politics, dance, theater, literature, athletics, and more. More recently, we celebrated Brush graduates, and they came back to share their wins and losses with our students. Typically, our history tributes are student-driven and student-focused, but this year is different. The pandemic caused us to make many adjustments, so in keeping with the call for change, we decided to involve our staff in this year's celebration of African American achievement. And we asked several representative members of Brush staff and students to share their thoughts on influential African Americans. Some of the names discussed may be familiar to you, some may not. Hi, my name is Mrs. Lewis. I teach social studies here at Brush High School and I chose for my historical figure, and actually someone who is an inspiration to me, Frederick Douglass. In college, we were given the opportunity to read this book. It's called The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, written by himself. And as the title implies, he wrote it in his own words, what his experiences were with slavery. Um, I find him inspirational because as I was reading this, first of all, I couldn't believe that a former slave wrote these words. They were just so well written. Um, but also his determination in just about anything. I, I recognize that I could use that to accomplish just about anything that I wanted to do. So with Frederick Douglass, this is the 1830s, he was determined to be educated. He was determined to find kids on the street to continue this education because he knew it was so important to him. Uh, he was determined to find freedom. He knew what was at stake, um, but still he continued on his journey and he made it to freedom. And the thing that I find most inspiring is he's living this simple married life and he recognizes his um, determination to speak um, for those who were still enslaved about his story and the story of so many others. Hi, my name is Sally Fine. I'm the English department chair at Brush High School. And I would like to talk to you about Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston. I'm not sure if she was a woman ahead of her time or as a society, we've just taken a very long time to embrace her vision. What she offers in Their Eyes Were Watching God is a feminist character who longs for love and isn't willing to settle for less regardless of how long it takes or how many rules of society she must break. Janie is her own person and thus serves as a strong role model for our young women in the 21st century. Hurston's words should not be read quickly but rather savored so that you can appreciate how her prose borders on the poetic, how every word is carefully chosen so that you can experience it through your senses. 
So Janie waited a bloom time and a green time and an orange time. But when the pollen again gilded the sun and sifted down on the world, she began to stand around the gate and expect things. What things? She didn't know exactly. Her breath was gusty and short. She knew things that nobody had ever told her. For instance, the words of the trees and the wind. She often spoke to falling seeds and said, I hope you fall on soft ground, because she had heard seeds saying that to each other as they passed. She knew the world was a stallion rolling in the blue pasture of ether. She knew that God tore down the old world every evening and built a new one by sunup. It was wonderful to see it take form with the sun and emerge from the gray dust of its making. The familiar people and things had failed her, so she hung over the gate and looked up the road towards way off. She knew now that marriage did not make love. Janie's first dream was dead, so she became a woman. Hi, my name is Lily El Sheikhtaha, and I'm a senior at Brush High School. I thought one very compelling passage from Their Eyes Were Watching God was this one. In Their Eyes Were Watching God, Hurston states, there are years that ask questions and years that answer. Janie had had no chance to know things, so she had to ask. Did marriage end the cosmic loneliness of the unmated? Did marriage compel love like the sun in the day? So not only is this passage meaningful, but I think it is very relatable. I think everyone experiences moments where we have more questions than answers. Um, there are moments in life where you don't know what's going to happen next and you feel this overwhelming feeling of uncertainty and I think everyone experiences fright when they have this. And I think Hurston just reminds us to just breathe because time is just a cycle of seasons and each season has a collection of different questions and answers and life will just take you through these seasons and you will be, you will find your answers. So I think she really shows the importance of that and tells us to just relax because that's how life goes and that's how the cycle of life uh, continues. And then the importance of Their Eyes Were Watching God is I think it is a very strong representation of black modern womanhood. Uh, this was a risk for her to write because not only was this a new topic, but she uh, creates a protagonist who is not only just a strong African-American woman, but this portrays her exploration of love, which was a very unexplored topic. Um, Hurston also reveals that it is possible for all black women, uh, no matter what location or social status or level of education, to be worthy of a love they desire. And this also encourages African Americans to embrace love based on partnership and not ownership. And I think she shows this. This also reflects on Janie's exploration through the different love affairs she experiences, that she really does find the meaning of love when she is encountered with a partnership. Hi, my name is Jasmine Rozier, and I'm a senior at Charles F. Brush High School. Zora Neale Hurston wrote Their Eyes Are Watching God, which is a really important book to touch on problems of racism and feminism. But not only those two topics, she also touches on colorism. If you aren't aware of what colorism is, it's a problem of prejudice against darker skinned black people in, or darker skinned complexion people in communities of people of color. One passage that really resonates with this problem comes from a person speaking to one of the protagonists. Tea cake, you show is a lucky man, Sop to Bottom told him. A person can see every place you hit her. I bet she never raised her hand to hit you back neither. Take some of these old rusty black women and couldn't tell you ever hit them. That's the reason I don't quit beating my woman. You can't make no mark on them at all. Lord, wouldn't I love to whip a tender woman like Janie? I bet she don't even holly. She just cries, yeah, Tea cake? In this case, Janie is, one, is the main character who has a lighter complexion and straighter hair compared to other black people in her community. She's being praised as if she were some higher pure, purific factor against her own community. 
the two men speaking in this, shop, stop to bottom, is praising Janie as if she were the best black woman he's ever come across. Compared to the darker woman in his own community, he speaks down on them as if they're dirt and nothing more than just animals. This is important to put in this story because not enough people are aware of this problem of colorism in these communities. Especially feminism because these men think it's okay to hit women when it's not. But in this case, they think um, the weaker the woman is, then the better power they have over them. And in this case, they see the lighter complexion women as weaker in regards to them being put against of dar darker women. This is important to know. This is important to read because not only does it uh, explain colorism against dark black women, but it also shows how favored light-skinned women are against black, darker black women and light-skinned women. It also touches on the fact that feminism needs to be a more touched on topic since the men speaking to each other think it's okay to hit their women and the fact that they can't speak back to them or yell back at them. And if they do, it's a problem. Zora Neale Hurston did a really good job at touching on this topic throughout the book because the character Janie herself realizes that the, the, her own community doesn't appreciate the darker complexions around her, but she doesn't really have a voice to say much about it because she realized she's more favored over them. Hi, I'm Bridget Johnson, the ninth grade school counselor at Birch High School. Harlem, a brief but powerful 11-line poem written by my favorite poet, the late great poet Langston Hughes, about the experience of black Americans in 1951, includes a timeless question, a universal theme, and his poetic genius. It is my belief that this lyric poem birthed so many masterpieces in American history, literature, and politics that became timeless, universal, and genius, including but not limited to the play by Lorraine Hansberry, A Raisin in the Sun, Dr. King's famous I Have a Dream speech, as well as Harlem Renaissance. As an English teacher, school counselor, and parent, I will always incorporate, the, incorporate this great poem in my life's goal to instruct and inspire. Harlem by Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or sugar and syrup over like syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? Timeless, universal, and poetic genius, Langston Hughes encountered many deferred dreams and sadness, but he kept pushing, kept climbing, all while experiencing police brutality, racism at Columbia University, and the constant no in the literary world. Langston Hughes went on to publish novels, poems, plays, and essays, and is celebrated and studied in American literature and colleges today. I'm Adriana Sanchez, and I'm in the ninth grade. Um, I am doing the poem Let America Be America Again by Langston Hughes with Miss Sarah Ball. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be the great strong land of love where never kings convive nor tyrants scheme. That any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wealth, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There never, there's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I'm the poor white fooled and pushed apart. I'm the Negro bearing slavery scars. I'm the red man driven from the land. I'm the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in flat ancient chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of work the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer bondsman to the soil. I am the worker sold to the machine. I am the Negro servant to you all. I am the people humble, hungry, mean. Hungry, yet today, despite the dream, 
beaten yet today. Oh, pioneers, I am the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker battered through the years. Yet I am the one who dreamt our basic dream in our old world while still a surf of kings who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true. Yet even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone and every furrow turned that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be home. For I'm the one who left the dark island shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lean. And tore from black Africa, I stand, I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today? The millions shot down when we strike? The millions who have nothing for our pay? For all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've had and all the flags we've hung. The millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again. The land that never has been yet and yet must be. The land where every man is free. The land that's mine. The poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me. Who made America? Whose sweat and blood? Whose faith and pain? Whose hand at the foundry? Whose plow in the rain? Must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again. America. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of the great green states and make America again. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Curtis Jackson. I'm an administrator here in the South Euclid Leonard School District at Charles F. Brush High School. And today I wanna to talk to you about one of the uh, people that influenced my life. His name was James Baldwin, born, he was born August 2nd, 1924 in Harlem and unfortunately he passed away in France in 1987. I talk about and I think about James Baldwin as if he was part of my family. He could have easily been my uncle who had gone to Vietnam. He could have easily been my grandfather who owned his own trucking company. The difference was he was a novelist. He was a playwright. He was a revolutionary. He talked about the, time, the times that went on in the United States about how the people, black people, were treated how we were not allowed to, to, be, to get educated, how we were not allowed to own land, how to buy property. James Baldwin lived his life as if there was gonna be a tomorrow, but he lived each day in his playwrights. When I think about Native Son, which was an excellent book, when I think about Telling on the Mountaintop, but the most inspirational thing that James Baldwin had for me that, that captivated me was, I'm not that Negro that that was a uh, playwright that he talked about the differences between uh, Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King. And it hit home for him because he talked about how it related to him personally. In closing, I'd like to leave you with one quote from Mr. James Baldwin. I am not a black Muslim for the same vein, though different reasons I did not become a Black Panther because I did not believe that white people were devils and I did not want young black people to believe that either. I was not a member of any Christian congregation because I knew that I had heard and that how I lived, that they did not follow the commandments, love thy neighbor, and I did love my neighbors. And I was not a member of the NAACP because in the North where I grew up, where he grew up, the NAACP was fatally attracted to the black class distinction and they repel a little boy like me. Hi, I'm Dr. Fuller, one of the assistant principals here at Charles F. Brush High School. When I think about a famous African-American poet, writer, civil rights leader, many come to mind who have had a major impact upon my life. However, probably the number one person I definitely would say is Maya Angelou. She was born April 14th, 1928 
and passed away May 28, 2014. Maya's name originally was Marguerite Annie Johnson and she was born in St. Louis, Missouri. She was an African-American famous writer who was most famous for her poems and seven autobiographies. She was a prolific writer who explored numerous themes in her poems, including that of women, love, loss, discrimination, struggle, music, and even racism. Maya Angelou has often been referred to as people's poet and black women's poet laureate. Her poems continue to be extremely popular and have been referred to as the anthems of African Americans. Known about the poetry of Maya Angelou through her 10 most famous poems include Phenomenal Woman, Alone, and Still I Rise. One of her famous quotes that resonated with me that I have chosen to live my life by is the following. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. Hi, I'm Mrs. Stranick. I teach global literature and American literature. One of my favorite American novelists is Toni Morrison. I love the way that Morrison inhabits her characters, bringing them fully to life whenever her narration slips into one. I also am fascinated by the way that Morrison's characters hold up a startling reflection to American culture. In The Bluest Eye, Morrison examines the ways that our ideals about love and beauty can sabotage us. The sabotage is all the more devastating when her black characters don't see themselves reflected in American ideas about beauty. Reading this passage from The Bluest Eye is my student Arthur Bargainer, who's studying Morrison for his research paper in Honors American Literature this year. The passage describes the impact of ideals about beauty and love on Pauline, who's already struggling with her marriage to Choli. One winter, Pauline discovered she was pregnant. When she told Charlie, he surprised her by being pleased. He began to drink less and come home more often. They eased back into a relationship more like the early days of their marriage, when he asked if she were tired or wanted him to bring her something from the store. In this state of ease, Pauline stopped doing day work and returned to her own housekeeping. But the loneliness in those two rooms had not gone away. When the winter sun hit the peeling green paint of the kitchen chairs, when the smoke talks were boiling in the pot, when all she could hear was the truck delivering furniture downstairs, she thought about back home about how she had been alone most of the time then too, but that this lonesomeness was different. Then she stopped staring at the green chairs at the delivery truck. She went to the movies instead. There in the dark, her memory was refreshed and she succumbed to her earlier dreams. Along with the idea of romantic love, she was in introduced to another, physical beauty, probably the most destructive ideas in the history of human thought. Both originated in envy thrived in insecurity and ended in disillusion. In equating physical beauty with virtue, she stripped her mind, bound it, and collected self-contempt by the heat. She forgot lust and simple caring for. She regarded love as possessive mating and romance as the goal of the spirit. It will be for her a wellspring from which she would draw the most destructive emotions, deceiving the lover and seeking to imprison the beloved, curtailing freedom in every way. And Morrison uses her writing to clarify the African-American experience and struggle. The standard of beauty in our community has always been a huge problem. Even today's past still applies. Social media and pop culture has made black men and women feel like they are not good enough for society. This, this passage means so much to me and I'm sure many others feel the same. I thank her so much for spreading this timeless message to empower the black community. Hi, my name is Jim Stranick. I'm a pediatric cardiologist here in Cleveland at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. And I'd like to talk to you today about um, a man named Vivian Thomas. He was a uh, lab uh, technician who helped develop a, a surgical procedure that has saved um, thousands and thousands of uh, children's lives over the uh, last few years. Um, his lifelong dream was to be a uh, doctor However, he was um, born just before the Great Depression, and unfortunately, um, though he saved up money, he was unable to uh, afford to go to medical school. In fact, he only graduated high school. Um, after high school, 
he uh, uh, got a job uh, working as a lab technician um, with a, a very well-known cardiologist named Alfred Blaylock. Um, Alfred Blaylock uh, took a chance on him. Um, Vivian Thomas um, uh, happened to be an African-American, um, and this was in the 1940s. So you could um, understand that uh, this uh, was a big challenge. Um, this was a time where uh, segregation was rampant in uh, Northern America. And um, uh, it was also a time of a uh, huge amount of stress because he hired him in the 1940s. That also happened to be World War II. Um, so Vivian Thomas and uh, Dr. Blaylock were working on an experiment uh, to try to reproduce lung injury in soldiers um, they uh, were unable to completely reproduce the, the injury that they have, but their initial work sa saved thousands and thousands of American troops' lives. Um, but the big story is when uh, Alfred Blaylock was hired to go and uh, take care of patients at Johns Hopkins University. Johns Hopkins is a very storied medical school. Um, it's a famous medical school, and it's one of the best in the country. So it was a dream job of uh, B Dr. Blaylock to go there. And uh, part of the stipulation for him to go there was th that he was able to bring Vivian Thomas with him. Uh, so they moved from Nashville, Tennessee to uh, Baltimore, uh, Maryland, uh, part of the South. And um, uh, Vivian had a tough time. He had a hard time uh, finding housing. Uh, he had a hard time fitting in. Um, he couldn't use the same bathroom as everybody else. And he wasn't paid as a lab technician, which was what his job was, but he was uh, paid as a janitor. He had to use the janitor's entrance, and um, he had to eat lunch in a different spot. It really was a, a big deal. Um, but uh, he persevered. Uh, he uh, did an experiment with Dr. Blaylock where they figured out a way uh, to save uh, the lives of these babies that were born with what's called blue baby syndrome. The fancy name for that is Tetralogy of Fallot. Um, tetralogy means four different things, um, and Dr. Fallot is the first person to describe it. Um, this was at a time where they didn't have the heart-lung machines that we have now. They didn't have cardiac bypass. They didn't have intensive care units that we have. They didn't have any of the modern stuff that we have. In fact, they didn't even have a tool to be able to do this. Uh, Vivian Thomas, by his dad was a mechanic, um, and his dad taught him how to um, shape metal. Um, and he was actually able to shape his own tools to do this procedure. And so uh, Vivian Thomas and Dr. Blaylock figured out a way to get more blood flow to go to the lung arteries. That's the biggest problem in Tetralogy of Fallot is that you don't have enough blood going to your lungs. You don't pick up oxygen, so your blood gives you a blue tinge to your skin. So you look a little bit blue in the face and the hands. Um, having low oxygen levels doesn't um, allow you to live for a long time. Um, so a, a doctor, Dr. Helen Tausig, was taking care of these pediatric patients. She said, Dr. Blaylock, is there a way you could uh, fix this? And he remembered a failed experiment that he and Vivian had performed that ended up giving a lot more blood flow to the lungs. So um, they uh, made an experiment in what's called a laboratory where they use dogs as their subjects. Um, they first limited the amount of blood flow that goes to the lungs. Um, that resulted in the dogs dying, which you would expect. And then they were able to save the dogs by um, getting more blood flow to the lungs. So Vivian Thomas did these procedures over and over and over again. Dogs kept dying, um, but eventually um, uh, a dog named Annie, she's the only dog that has her picture hanging at Johns Hopkins University, um, they were able to get her through. And she lived um, for quite a long time um, having done this procedure. Um, and then a patient came. Um, an 11 year old patient named Eleanor um, came and uh, uh, she had Tetralogy of Fallot and they thought she would be a great candidate. The trick though was that Dr. Blaylock had never performed this procedure. Uh, Vivian Thomas had always been the primary person doing the procedure. Um, and, uh, but Vivian Thomas was a black guy in Maryland. Um, Baltimore was not friendly to um, African Americans. Um, Dr. Blaylock goes in to do the procedure, and he is bringing Vivian along with him. And the doctors in the operating suite who are going to watch this brand new procedure that's never been done before said, no, he can't come in. 
And Dr. Blaylock said, then I can't do the procedure because uh, he's never done it before. He's done a lot of surgeries, his hands are very talented, but he has never done this procedure. If you look up Vivian Thomas and uh, uh, Alfred Blaylock and Helen Tausig, there's this famous picture of Dr. Blaylock standing, doing the operation, and there's a man behind him. Um, he's wearing a white coat and black pants. He's the only person wearing um, black pants. Everybody else in the whole picture is wearing white pants. And I think that's a, a very moving picture, and you see him kind of leaning in just a little bit, and he's actually whispering to Dr. Blaylock, okay, do this now, now do this, now do that. And they were able to save the life of this child. Um, and since then, we have done this procedure in countless amount of patients. Um, hundreds of thousands of patients are alive today uh, because of uh, Vivian Thomas and his ingenuity, his um, creativity, and is willing to take risks. Um, and today, um, we honor him by calling the surgery the Blaylock Tausig Thomas Shunt. Um, he now has top billing because of all the work he's done for that procedure. Um, he is also a, uh, an honorary doctor at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he did pass away um, many years ago, but his um, gift to us as pediatric cardiology is cardiologist lives on uh, forever. Hi, my name is Mr. Naughton and I am the psychology teacher here at Brush High School. Today for African American Month I wanted to talk to you about a couple of African American psychologists who made a large contribution. I wanted to particularly talk about a married couple, Ken Clark and Mammy Clark. The Clarks were the first African Americans to obtain their doctoral degrees in psychology from Columbia University. Ken Clark was the first African American tenured full professor at the City College of New York, the first African American to be president of the American Psychological Association, and the first African American appointed to the New York State Board of Regents. The Clarks opened their own agency in 1946 called the Northside Center for Child Development. This was the first full-time guidance center offering psychological and casework services to families in the Harlem area. They also contributed by conducting experiments on racial biases in education. The Clarks were influential to the civil rights movement and their expertise allowed them to testify as expert witnesses in several school desegregation cases, including the famous Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. Outside of their research and applied contributions, they both served in the community and on committees to make a difference. Mammy Clark passed in 1983, leaving two children behind. Ken Clark later passed away in 2005. Both made significant contributions to their field of psychology and to the social movement of their time. And to that, I thank them. I am Joan Kelly, and I teach African American history and government here at Brush. And the African American person that I chose to discuss today was Diane Nash because she's incredibly inspirational. She grew up in Chicago in the 1940s, and it was segregated, but it wasn't the strict segregation of the Jim Crow laws in the South. But in 1959, she chose Fisk University and HBCU in Nashville to attend and when she gets there, she's like, college, she's excited. Her and her roommate want to go see the town. And she realizes how confining Jim Crow laws were. They couldn't go to public pools. Libraries were segregated. Restaurants, as a matter of fact, in Nashville, African Americans had to get their food to go at restaurants. And so people would be sitting on the curb eating or standing out in alleys eating the food they just purchased from a restaurant. So. This is when she began to work with SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, to try to end segregation in, at lunch counters in Nashville. And she went through this whole process of being trained on how to do nonviolent resistance. And after about a year, they ended segregation at lunch counters in Nashville, and it was the first Southern city to do so. After this, she joins, she started the SNCC, the Student Nonviolent coordinating committee along with Ella Baker and several others and takes up later the cause for the Congress on Racial Equality to integrate interstate bus lines 
where the Montgomery bus boycott had ended segregation in states on buses, on public transportation, the laws that banned uh, integration for interstate travel and the terminals themselves were still in place. So in 1961, here she's 20 years old and she's about to go on this very dangerous expedition with the Freedom Riders and she gets a call from Robert Kennedy's office who was the Attorney General and they're begging her to convince her and her friends and fellow civil rights activists to back off. It's too dangerous in the South. And she informs him, because they talked to her like she was a child. She was like, you know, a kid. She's 18, 19 years old. And they said, you don't realize how danger it, dangerous it is. And she said, we already made out our wills. She was willing to die to create these changes in our society. And she went into the South on these Greyhound buses, was arrested on several occasions, spent time in jails in Southern cities, and she risked her life to change a system that exploited and oppressed African Americans and made it so that our, we ended up with a society that did not really have a social contract for all Americans. And I always think, what could somebody with that kind of bravery and that kind of tenacity, and this goes for all of these civil rights leaders, what could they have done if their lives weren't made to, were put, didn't have all these struggles, didn't have all these obstacles in their way. What could they have accomplished instead of having to fight? So I think that we have to be so appreciative of the barriers that they uh, took down and what, what they did for the, our society as a whole. Hi, I'm Dennis Matsko. I'm a U.S. history teacher here at Brush. An African American that I have admired most of my life, uh, I think I read about this person in probably 1970, 71. His name is Kelvin Hill. I think many of you won't even know who he is, but he was a very good football player for the Dallas Cowboys. When I was in third grade, maybe, I read an article in a magazine called Boys Life Magazine. We were in the library at school that day, and I began reading about this guy, and the more I read about him, the more I liked him, it ended up him making me that I switched from the uh, Cleveland Browns as my favorite football team to the Dallas Cowboys. And what made that occur was as I was reading the article, they were saying what a humble man he is, how he wanted to be a minister, but he gave that life up simply because he was drafted so high out of Yale, the University of Yale. And he was an Ivy League player uh, who made it for a very long time in the NFL. He, uh, I don't know that he ever became a preacher, but I know he did some great things in his life. And by the time I was in my teens, he was traded to the Cleveland Browns. So once again, I, I thought, wow, great, here's my hero. And now he's playing for my hometown team. Uh, years later, uh, he and his wife had a child, and may, many of you may know who Grant Hill is. That's his son, and what's unique is they were both very humble people, very good people, and that Calvin Hill was NFL Rookie of the Year, I think in 1969, and when Grant Hill joined the NBA, he was the Rookie of the Year probably 20 plus years later. So Calvin Hill's a person who I've admired for a very, very long time. So anyways, Calvin Hill is the person I think that I have always admired uh, who happens to be African American. Hi, my name is Vadim Rafkin and I am a social studies teacher here at Brush High School. My inspirational African American figure is Myron Roll, a former NFL safety who is currently a neurosurgeon at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, I think his story is very unique and very interesting and just pretty cool. Um, growing up as a kid, I played football and I thought playing football was the coolest thing in the world. If I could play in the NFL, who wouldn't want to do that for a living? Um, obviously, I was not capable of doing so, but I thought, man, if someone has the talent and ability to do so, who would want to do something else? Who'd want to give that up? I thought it was the coolest thing in the world to play professional football. Well, Myron Roll had the talent and ability to do so. As a high school player, he was one of the top high school football players in the country back in 2006. Um, he ended up going to Florida State University and was one of the top college safeties 
um, during his time at Florida State and was projected to be a first round draft pick. But Myron Roll had other aspirations. He wanted to pursue a career in medicine and had the opportunity, he was actually awarded a Rhodes Scholarship to study at Oxford University in England. And he gave up his senior year of football. He had graduated college in two and a half years. So he had finished his undergraduate degree at Florida State, but had a chance to play football his senior year and actually gave it up to go to England and pursue this Rhodes Scholarship to study medical anthropology in which he received his master's degree. Once he returned from Oxford, he actually went into the NFL draft and was still, despite taking a year off of football, was still drafted into the NFL. He was that good. He played uh, for the Tennessee Titans and the Pittsburgh Steelers for a couple years, but realized that his heart was more so in medicine. He wanted to give back to people. So he left the NFL. He was a, he was a person, he had the talent to play in the NFL and left the NFL to pursue medical school. In 2013, he went back to Florida State to pursue medical school. Um, he wanted to be a neurosurgeon. Uh, eventually, he graduated medical school and was accepted for a residency at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital, where he currently still works. Um, he's had a number of specials made on him and was interviewed last year during the coronavirus pandemic um, as he talked about um, working on the front lines and what they, he was going through, even as a neurosurgeon, how everyone kind of puts that aside and everyone's helping to fight this pandemic. So I thought his story was just really unique that um, as, as young kids, most boys, if they have a chance to play football and they like it, their dream is to go to the NFL. And you had um, this person that had all the ability in the world and did it and still chose to say, you know what, I'm going to walk away from this and I'm going to go help people and be a brain surgeon. So that was Myron Roll, my African-American inspirational figure. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Carl Williamson, building principal of Charles F. Brush High School. Today I'm gonna to talk about great musician, Grover Washington Jr. He's considered as the pioneer in jazz music as he bridged jazz to modern day music. His play inspired the likes of Kenny G. Grover was nominated for eight Grammy Awards in which he won a Grammy for his record, Just the Two of Us, and his song, Wine Light. Grover is a proven instrumental genius who continues to reach the musical minds of today's generation. My name is Khalil Black. I am a 10th grade student at Brush High School, and I'm introducing a African-American inspirational figure, Chadwick Boseman. Dear Chadwick Boseman, there's so many things that I could say and write, but none of them would express the amount of appreciation and respect that I have for you. So I'll keep it short and simple. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you have proved to not just me, but people all around the world. You didn't just play superhero, you were a superhero. You not only battled villains on film, but you violated your personal villains off screen as well. You never let that stop you from continuing what you love to do though. You proved to us that not all superheroes needed to be white, or have fancy powers, or even a weird super suit. Although you may not have realized it, it wasn't just the character we were looking up to but instead the person behind the mask and underneath the suit. The same person who brought every role that he played to life. May that have been a court justice, a baseball player, or even a simple comic book character. You didn't just act in a role, you were the role. So thank you. Thank you for showing us no matter what obstacles life throw at you, never give up. You don't allow it to stop doing what you love. May you rest in peace. Sincerely, Khalil Black. Marva Collins was a passionate educator who believed all children could learn. When she became frustrated with the lowered educational standards for students in the Chicago public schools, she decided to open her own school, the West Side Preparatory School. She would start the school with her two children and a few neighborhood kids. The students in her school would perform so well on standardized tests that Collins would be offered the Secretary of Education position by President Ronald Reagan. Collins declined. Collins declined the position as she believed it was more important for her 
to continue to build her educational program at Westside Preparatory School. Collins died in 2015. She was 78 years old. She was an educator who believed all children could learn, a belief shared by myself and my fellow educators here at Brush High School. Collins spent her lifetime helping students reach their educational goals. She said, I'm a teacher. A teacher is someone who leads. There is no magic here. I do not walk on water. I do not part the sea. I just love children. My tribute today is to all the educators who, like Marva Collins, are just people who love children and want to see them become the history makers of the future. Thank you for watching. We wish you a very happy and celebratory Black History Month. Thank you.